Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am here in sunny California with our Wednesday night Bible study. I have a graduation on this evening, so that's why we're getting here a little bit earlier today so that we can get this class in, a very important lesson. And we are grateful for this opportunity to present this material to each and every one of you. We are in lesson 34. Lesson 34 of our 52 lesson journey through the Torah, the first five books of the Bible in one year. We began with the festival of Sukkot. Uh, on the eighth day of the festival is when the word is read. The scriptures are right, the scroll is taken out, and the entire Torah is read to the people. And so we are grateful for this opportunity to go through this information with you line upon line, precept upon precept. We don't own the right to this music that you're hearing, but we just use it to get our hearts and minds ready. And believe me, with everything that's going on here in California with me, uh, I do need a moment to get everything together. Uh, once again, in my mind, is so different than what I normally have, but yet and still, uh, we are grateful. We could not do Wednesday night, so we had to do Wednesday afternoon. And so thank you all for joining me, and we'll be getting started momentarily. So listen to this music that I don't own the rights to, but we use it, getting our hearts and minds ready to receive what the you are Kakadesh. The Holy Spirit will reveal through the word on today. So bless you for joining us. And shalom to everyone. Yes, we want to make certain that we have the opportunity to go through the instructions. The first five books are called the instructions of the Torah, which means instruction. It means this is what Jehovah, our creator, spoke to Moses to speak to the children of Israel because they said it was too great to hear the voice of Jehovah for them, so they asked Moses to intercede on their behalf and bring back the report. And we still find ourselves doing that today, asking someone else to hear the voice of God so that they could bring back a report to us. But it's important for us to go through this word of instruction line upon line and precept upon precept so that we can in fact teach it to our children and our children's children. So we thank you for joining us, and we are getting ready to begin our lesson 34, which is <clears throat> Bamidbar, which in Hebrew, <clears throat> the word is Bamidbar, uh, the Greek and the uh, Italian brought in the word numbers, because it, it involves a lot of numbers. But there's a specific reason for that. But we need to look at the Hebrew source to find out why. Why are these numbers so important? And what is it that Jehovah our God is trying to tell us, even on today, about our importance as we go through the word, line upon line, precept upon precept. So we're going to begin. We're going to shut off our music and begin and Pray that we don't have any interruptions, but I can't promise that because this, this happens, especially when we're going from uh, normally 8 o'clock Eastern time to 3 o'clock Eastern time and 12 o'clock Pacific time. So thank you for joining us. Let us pray, and then we're going to begin. Jehovah, our Elohim, King of the universe, our God, our Father, we just bless you for this opportunity you presented before us, giving us a social medium where we can go forth 
and present your word to your people. We thank you for the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit that comes to guide us into all truth as we go on this journey to open our hearts and our minds to receive the truth and to empower us to be obedient and doers of this word. So we bless you and praise you for all that you do. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. Amen. Okay, so we're in the book of Numbers. So open your Bible to the book of Numbers. We're going to be starting with the very first verse. And uh, we're going to do a little uh, preview or kind of a lesson uh, of preparation for what we're going to be involved in on our discussions on today. Remember the word in Hebrew is bamitbar, which means in the wilderness. In the wilderness is where all of this information was brought forth to give to the children of Israel. One thing about the wilderness, uh, it gets your attention because it is the same every day. I remember when we visited Dubai, they told us they have 360 days of the same type of weather. And maybe on five days a year, they get rain. Well, that's the same thing in the wilderness. You may get some rain uh, once or twice a year, but that's pretty much it. So Jehovah has your attention. He's put you in the proper location to bring forth this covenant promises. And the same thing he's doing for us. We may go through some wilderness experiences, but the Ruach HaKadosh takes us in those experiences just as he did the Lord Yeshua when he took him, led him into the wilderness to be tested, well, it's the same for us. We need to be put in places where we can steal all of the noise around us and be prepared to hear our instructions from the Ruach HaKodesh. And so we just thank God that he's given us that time. And, and, and this silence, this period of silence is necessary because in the day's routine, we have so much coming at us. And our minds is recording everything that our, our sight is bringing and our ears, is bring, our ears are bringing through hearing. And so all of these things are going on. Our nose is bringing through smell. So all of these uh, senses are operating with us at all times. And so with that, then we have to get what? Silent in order to hear what Jehovah is saying to us and then uh, prepare ourselves to deal with whatever the instructions are that we hear, whether we hear it in uh, a presentation from the Ruach HaKadosh through an oral prophetic word for us, or we hear it through our reading. Because as we're reading, we're using the sight and the mind, and then it has to play back our experiences to us so that we can be doers of the word. And so in the wilderness is not a bad place. The wilderness is a good place because it is a place where we can go and hear the instructions better from Jehovah, our God, through the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, which he has given each of the believers in Yeshua, his son, uh, given the Ruach HaKodesh to us so that we can do what? He will walk with us. He goes alongside of us, and he's, we want him to be our guide. We want him to be our uh, comforter, our counselor, and we want him to give us strength to be obedient, to steal out all these other noises and everything else and hear what the Spirit will speak to us even through the word as we go through it on today. So we want to do what it's called, it is called in Hebrew, kol demana the cop, which means a very still, quiet voice. The same voice that the prophet Elijah Hill heard when he went back up to this same mountain to hear what Jehovah had to say to him. And so we want to practice understanding that there's times when you need to be still. Even in our prayer time as we're praying, we're exercising so much in terms of our, our hearing and, and, and our speech. And we're exercising this through the, the structures of our mind that the creator has given us. And we have to be, take opportunities to be still when we get them. And when they do come, we wanna be able to pay attention. So we, you, 
We thank God for the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit that comes to provide us with these opportunities. So when we find ourselves in very difficult and complex situations, it's not a time to panic. It's a time to go be still and hear what the one who controls all things is trying to say to us about that particular situation. And so that's what we want to in fact do. So the way that the creator has connected us in our mind and in our sense, the sense realm, all of those things are things that we need to utilize the practice of silence. Some people call it meditation. It, it may only be for a few moments, but during that time, we're putting ourselves in position to hear what it is the Holy Spirit is saying to us because just like with the prophet Elijah, he's not gonna shout, he's not gonna scream. It's in that what? That kol dimana daka, that, that still quiet voice that we will hear what the Ruach HaKadosh is speaking into our hearts and our minds. So now with that, let us uh, begin our lesson on today from Numbers chapter one, uh, verse one. Jehovah spoke to Moses in the Sinai desert in the wilderness. That's what that title Bamidbar comes from. In the tent of meeting on the first day of the second month of the second year, after they had left the land of Egypt. Jehovah said, take a census of the entire assembly of the people of Israel by clans and families. Record the names of all of the men 20 years old and over who are subject to military service in Israel. You and Aaron are to enumerate them company by company. So basically tribe by tribe. And in the tribes, there are different clans even in each one of the tribes. From Reuben, Etzer, the son of Shadel, from Sh Simon or Simon, Shulamal, the son of Zashidal, from Judah, Naxalon, Nakshon, the son of Aminadab, from Issachar, Natan, Natan, or Nathan, the son of Zaur. Verse 9, from Zebulun, Eli, Eli, Elab, the son of Helon of the children of Joseph, all right? From Ephraim, Ishma, the son of Amihu. From Manasseh, remember Ephraim and Manasseh were the sons of Joseph who were adopted by their father Jacob because of this very thing, because they were gonna be ones that were gonna receive the blessings that would normally go to Joseph, which were going to go to his descendants. The sons of his descendants are the ones who would receive those blessings that Jacob promised to Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Verse 11, from Benjamin, Avidan, the son of Gedoni. From Dan, Achizar, the son of Amishadi. From Asher, Pegal, the son of Okran. From God, Elisha, the son of Deuel, and from Naphtali, Akira, the son of Enon. So these are the men that were leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. They were kind of like the leaders of that. So it was those people that would be brought together all throughout the book of Leviticus. We kept hearing the leaders being brought together. These are who those leaders were. These are the ones that were getting many of the instructions firsthand from Moses to then transfer to all the rest of the people. These were the ones called, verse 16, these were the ones called from the assembly, the chiefs of their father's clan, the heads of thousands in Israel. So Moses and Aaron took these men who had been designated by name. And on the first day of the second month, they gathered the whole assembly to the to state their genealogies by families and clans and recorded the names of all those 20 years old and over, those who were ready for military service, as well as their total numbers. Moses counted them in the desert of Bamidbar once again, just as Jehovah had ordered him. The men 20 years and old and over 
who were subject to military service were recorded by name. These were the ones who would lead each tribe as they were going forth, marching to the land of promise. All right. Family and clan, starting with the descendants of Reuben, Israel's firstborn or Jacob's firstborn, here are the totals. The descendants of Reuben were 46,500. The descendants of Simeon were 59,300. The descendants of Gad were 45,650. The descendants of Judah were 74,600. The descendants of Issachar were 54,400. The descendants of Zebulun, 57,400. The descendants of Ephraim, uh, 40,500. And the descendants of Manasseh, 32,200. The descendants of Benjamin, 35,400. The descendants of Dan, 62,700. The descendants of Asher, 41,500. And the descendants of Naphtali, 53,400. Moses, Aaron, and the 12 leaders of Israel, each from a clan, counted the people of Israel by their clan. Those 20 years old and over, eligible for military service in Israel. And the grand total came to 603,550. So this was quite a large army. And this is where the number 3 million or so comes from when it is estimated how many people actually left Egypt to go to the land of Canaan. It is basically taking these number of the numbers of the soldiers and multiplying that number by five to bring in all their family members, their wives and their daughters, and those that were too young and too old for military service. That's where the number several million comes from. It is from this census that was taken at this particular point in time as they were preparing to march to the land of Canaan. But those who were Levites, we're gonna go on. But those who were Levites, according to the clan of their fathers were not counted in this census because Jehovah had told Moses, do not include the clan of Levi when you take the census of the people of Israel. Instead, give the Levites charge over the tabernacle of the testimony. So they were gonna be responsible for the tabernacle, which had the tent of meeting in it with the holy and the holy of holies. The Levites were particularly responsible for that and Jehovah is gonna explain more. He's gonna tell them they are responsible for the tabernacle of the testimony, the equipment, and everything that else is connected with it. They are to carry the tabernacle and all its equipment, serve in it, and set up the camp around it. When the tabernacle is to be moved onward, it is the Levites who are to take it down and set it up in the new location. Anyone else who involves himself is to be put to death. The rest of Israel are to set up camp. Company by company, each man with his own banner. But the Levites are to camp around the tabernacle of the testimony so that no anger will come upon the assembly of the people of Israel. The Levites are to be in charge of the tabernacle of the testimony. And the chapter ends by saying, this is what the people of Israel did. They did everything that Jehovah had ordered Moses. So throughout our studies of the word, even in Leviticus, the people were listening to this word, which is called a Shema or hearing with the intent of being obedient. The same way we should listen to the word. And that is when we hear the word, we should be planning to be obedient to all of the instructions that we are reading in this word as we go through it. When we hear something, the Holy Spirit will minister to us because numbers are important because why? It gave everyone an understanding that each and every one is important. Everyone was equal to one number, one of the counts. And so by declaring this count, you're gonna find out that what's going to happen after they get to the land and, and their refusal, all of that, that number is gonna be repeated again and again and again. So we'll understand that these fighting men were responsible for going in and taking the land. For refusing that responsibility, a heavy price was paid. So what you under, we understand as a person today, even in, in the dis, 
dispensation that we're living in, we're, each one of us is important because Jehovah has a plan that he has for each one of us and he interconnects us. So even the people that we meet and everything else is all an interconnection of the importance that each person plays in the lives of others. And so that is why it's important that we learn, first of all, how to have a relationship with Jehovah, our God, and then how to have a relationship with one another because we want these contacts that we are making to be positive so that we can have a positive influence because that's what Jehovah would have us do as we're making these connections and have a positive influence on those, no matter who you are. I don't care if it's a person living on Skid Row out in the, it doesn't matter. That person is important to Jehovah, is a part of, even in this country, we just completed a census in 2020 so that everyone could be numbered. And everybody was fighting about whether or not they wanted to number everyone, but that's where this information comes from. It comes right here from the scriptures to take account so that at the end you can find out, you can find out how many people made it through, what percentage, and those numbers are important. It also helps us understand representation in the government. So census is very important. So when we look at all these numbers, don't think that they don't have any meaning and we just skip through it. No, that it is important. It was important then, it's important now. Each one of us is important. We are unique in the self. We all have different fingerprints. Everything about us, the creator put in there to make us in a unique part of his creation. And our responsibility is to hear from him and do what it is he created us to do. That is our responsibility. So let's go on to chapter two of Bamidbar. Jehovah said to Moses and Aaron, the people of Israel are to set up camp by clans, each man with his own banner and under his clan symbol. They are to camp around the temple of meeting, but at a distance. Once again, we're going to get into that, but that's why he said the Levites are responsible. So when you have a rectangle, then if you put one on the north, south, east, and west, one on each side, and you divide those clans into threes, which we're going to get into, when you divide those each side into threes, but the Levites were responsible for the direct uh, construction and dismantling of the tabernacle and to protect the tabernacle from crazy because the enemy gets into people's heads and they want to go and do things that they have no business doing, like spread some gra graffiti or something. <laughs> you know, people will do crazy things to things that God said they are holy. So the Levites were responsible for the direct perimeter around the tabernacle. That was their responsibility to make sure they guarded it. No one violated what that was designed to do. That was the job of the Levites. Those on the east side were Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. They were on the east side. The east side is where the entrance to the tabernacle was. On the east side, that's the only side you could enter into the tabernacle. And all around the tabernacle, there was a distance that man, because of his sinful inclination, was to keep from that tabernacle. And the Levites were responsible for making certain that man obeyed what was happening. So on the east side was Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. And there was 186,400 in that particular grouping. Uh, this group sets out first. So what Jehovah is doing is ordering everything. So now this group of people that just came together to, mark, to get out of Egypt, now Jehovah is ordering them in the, how they will situate themselves, how they will march as they proceed toward the land. All of this is being orchestrated by Jehovah to tell them, this is what I want you to do. And if you do this and you are obedient, you're going to have success. He says, those camping on the south, are to be under the banner of the camp of Reuben. They are to camp according to companies. By tribe and leader, they are as follows. You have Reuben, Simeon, and Gad. Reuben had 46,500. Sim, uh, Simeon had 59,300, and Gad, 45,650 fighting men. They were going to lead, and they were responsible for these three <coughs> tribes of Israel. They were responsible, excuse me. 
they break camp and they're going to follow the first group, which from the east side, which was led by Judah. Now Reuben brings up the second column of people that are going to come out. Verse 17, then the tent of meeting with the camp of the Levites will set out. So after this group of six tribes, in two groups of three, after that, in the middle, there's 12 tribes. In the middle, we're going to be the Levites and the tabernacle. The Levites are responsible for protecting the tabernacle, even on the journey. So on the journey, the Levites are going to handle whatever comes up to bother the tabernacle. The Levites are responsible for that. Those camping on the west will be under the banner of the camp of Ephraim. They are to camp according to the companies. By tribe and leader, they are to be as follows. Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. Those three groups were going to follow the Levites and the dismantling, dismantled tabernacle. They were following them, those three tribes. This group is to set out third. So Jehovah's ordering everything. And you're going to find out as we go through that the people that saw this was like, this is a mighty group of people. We can't fight. We can't win with them. So most of them had enough sense to say, you know what? We're going to leave that alone. For those that didn't, they're going to be defeated. That's the third group. You, and then you have the group of Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. Those are the fourth group of people. Asher, Dan, rather, with 62,700. They were the largest of the, in terms of number of fighting men. Asher, 41,500, and Naphtali, 53,400. There was a total of 157,600 fighting men in those three tribes. These are the ones, verse 32 says, counted from the people of Israel by clans. The total number recorded in the camps, once again, company by company, was 603,550. Those were the fighting men. They were designed to protect all of those that were part of their tribe, which would follow them on this march. Listen to what verse 34 says. No, I'm sorry. Verse 33 says, but as Jehovah ordered Moses, the Levites were now counted in that 603,550 that did not include, include the Levites. We're going to get into that more as to why Jehovah said that, but the Levites were not counted. There's a special way of counting for the Levites. Remember now in this counting, it was men, fighting men over the age of 20. These are the men that were counted and numbered in this manner. But they had a complete census of all the people. But the fighting men were the important ones and how they would line up and how they would lead the people on their journey to the land of Canaan. And it says in verse 34, the people of Israel did everything Jehovah had ordered Moses. They set up camp under their banners and they set out each according to his family and clan. So this is an orderly process. It ain't no just, we go going to the, no, you're going to do this. You're marching in a military format in a manner in which Jehovah, which is in the center of everything, is in the center is designed for you to do. And there was a purpose and plan even in that to bring fear into the hearts of all the others. Because if Jehovah wants them to fear, this column of people, if they see it coming, they're going to fear it. And this was important on this journey. So with that, we're going to get into chapter four. I'm sorry, chapter three. And once again, you saw that number, 603,000. That's a very important number. Because on refusal, that's the number of people that ain't going to make it. All right. So we got to, we want to keep that number in mind as we go through numbers, which tries to encapsulate everything that took place from this point on is numbers. Remember it said the second, the second month, the second day, the first month would be the month of Peshach or the Passover. They did the Passover celebration right there at Mount Sinai. Now they're getting ready to march on. And in this march, Jehovah has given them instructions as to how they are to conduct themselves, how they are to take that tabernacle down, and how they will re re reassemble it 
when they get to the next location where the cloud will let them know that this is where you are to stop. The cloud is gonna stop. When the cloud stops, everything stops. All right, so let's go on. These are the descendants of Aaron and Moses as of the day when Jehovah spoke with Moses on Mount Sinai. The names of the sons of Aaron are Nadab the firstborn, Abihu, Eleazar, and Itamar. These were the names of the sons of Aaron the priest, whom he anointed and ordained as priests. But, verse 3, verse 4, but Nadab and Abihu died in the presence of Jehovah when they offered unauthorized fire before Jehovah in the Sinai desert, and they had no children. So therefore, Eleazar and Itamar are going to serve. They're the only direct descendants now of Aaron that can serve in the office of high priest and their sons after them. The first two had no children. And so once they died, then that was it for their representation in terms of the families of the priesthood. Verse five, Adonai, uh, Jehovah said to Moses, summon the tribe of Levi and assign them to Aaron, the priest, the high priest, so that they can help him. They are to carry out his duties and the duties of the whole community before the tent of meeting and performing the service of the tabernacle. They are to be in charge of all the furnishings of the tent of meeting and to carry out all the duties of the people of Israel connected with the service of the tabernacle. Assign the Levites to Aaron and his sons. Their one responsibility in regard to the people of Israel is to serve Jehovah. You are to appoint Aaron and his sons to carry out the duties of priests. Anyone else who involves himself is to be put to death. Remember that before this time, all the clans believed that the heads of their families were the priests. All that's ended. Jehovah said, no, there's a specific priesthood that I have established. And since the people want to be obedient to everything Jehovah has said, then they have to break with that tradition and honor this tradition. You can still be head of your clan, but you are not to be considered in the priesthood of the service of the tabernacle. You cannot be considered for that. Only the descendants of Aaron, in which now there's only Eleazar and Itamar. That's it. And all of the Levites are to serve under the direction of Aaron and his two sons. Okay, we go on. Verse 11, Jehovah said to Moses, I have taken the Levites from among the people of Israel in lieu of every firstborn male that is first from the womb among the people of Israel. The Levites are to be mine. So normally the oldest son would be considered like a priest to his family after his father passed. His father is the priest. Once his father, it goes on to the oldest son. But Jehovah says, you're not a priest. You can still carry on all those other traditions, but this tradition, you're not a Levite. Only the Levite can serve at the sanctuary, at the tabernacle, all right? He goes on to say, all the firstborn males belong to me because on the day that I killed all the firstborn males in the land of Egypt, I separated for myself all the firstborn males of Israel, both human and animal. They are mine, I am Jehovah. So the, this is something that Jehovah did because so many people died in Egypt of the plague, that, the plague of death that because of the hard heartedness of Pharaoh and the Egyptian people. So then the firstborn, which we studied in Leviticus, was supposed to have a special offering taken to the temple because that belonged to Jehovah. But they paid the shekel price if they had those finances. If they didn't, they would pay a less of a price for the firstborn male because they belong. So the family was redeeming that firstborn male back from Jehovah by paying into the treasury because the Levites had taken the place of the firstborn male being dedicated in the service of Jehovah. The Levites were taking their place so they could pay this fee and go to the temple, which Yeshua did. We read about that. Yeshua went to the, his parents, Mary and Joseph, took him to the temple on the 40 days 
to bring him there for the dedication of Yeshua as the firstborn male of that family. And so he was dedicated to Jehovah and the price was paid so that they could redeem him back, which was a system that Jehovah set up. And the priests would then take the place of the Levites, took the place of all of the firstborn male. Jehovah's telling you right here, they belong to me. They are mine. I am Jehovah. Jehovah said to Moses in the desert, take a census of the tribe of Levi by clans and family. Count every male a month old or over. The fighting men were 20 years old and over. But for the priests, it starts one month after they are born. Take a census of the tribe of Levi by clans and family. Count every male a month old or over. Moses counted them in the manner Jehovah had said, as he had been ordered. The names of the sons of Levi were Gershom, Kot, and Merari. The names of the sons of Gershom were Levni and Shema. They fathered their respective clans. Likewise, the, songs of, the sons of Kahat, Kot, uh, Amar, Yitzar, Hebron, and Uzziel. Those were the sons of Kot. The sons of Makali and Mushi, those are Amar, Yitzar, Hebron, and Uzael. And so, verse 21, Gershom fathered the clans of Livni and Shimni and were the Gershon clans. Of them, 7,500 males a month old and over were counted. This is why they would study, their job is to study the Torah. Study the Torah forever. Their job from the time they're a month old, their parents are teaching them the Torah. And the first book they would get into was the book of Leviticus. This was the job of the priest. Gershom fathered the clan. Of them, 7,500 males a month old and over were counted. The Gershom clans were to camp behind the tabernacle toward the west. Remember, the immediate perimeter around the tabernacle had to be the Levites. And then on the other side of the Levites would be the clans of the three tribes of the three tribes of Israel. The chief of the Gershom clan was uh, Elasa and the son of Lael. In connection with the tenor meeting, the descendants of Gershom were to be in charge of the following the tabernacle itself, its inner and outer coverings, the screen for the entrance to the tent of meeting, the curtain surrounding the courtyard, the screen for the entrance of the courtyard surrounding the tabernacle and the altar, all the fixtures and ropes from these items and their maintenance. So these tribes, it shows you what they were responsible for in the assembly and dismantling of the tabernacle in the courtyard. Kahat fathered the clans of Amron and Itzar, Hebron and Uziel. These were the clans. Of them, 8,600 males a month old and over were counted. They were in charge of the holy place. The Kahat clans were to camp next to the tabernacle toward the south. So we had one group in the north. Now we got a group in the south. The chief of the Kahat clan was Elatzaphon, the son of Uzziah, they were responsible for the ark, the table, the menorah, the altars, the utensils, the priest, the utensils that the priests use when they serve in the holy place, the curtain, and everything involved with the maintenance of these things. Eleazar, the son of Aaron, Eleazar, he's what he's in line to be high priest. He's now the oldest of the sons of Aaron that are still alive. Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, was first among the chiefs of the Levites and supervised those in charge of the holy place. So that's the group that we're going to be in charge of, the holy place and everything that was in it. Marar followed the clans of Maki and Mushi. They were the Marar clans. Of them, 6,200 males a month old and older were counted. The chief of the Marar clans were uh, Tazuria, the son of Avikala. They were to camp next to the tabernacle toward the north. 
The Marak lands were assigned responsibility for the frames of the tabernacle. Around, along with its crossbars, posts, sockets, fittings, together with their maintenance. Also the posts of the surrounding courtyard and their sockets, pegs, and ropes. There were a specific job given to each one. And from the time that this time on, they are going to teach about these things. This is what your responsibilities are. They're going to be special cities that they would live in once they came into the land. But on this journey, which was supposed to be like an 11 day journey, but ended up being 40, almost 40 years during this time, they were supposed to be learning and understanding all of the duties that they were given in terms of assembling and dismantling the uh, tabernacle in the courtyard with the penalty of death for doing it incorrectly. So they were gonna make sure they studied it and went over and over and over it so that they didn't, uh, Jehovah didn't kill them uh, through one means or another, either su supernaturally or, you know, as we say, health wise, you would die. But that was the penalty. So it was very necessary that this understanding was maintained throughout all of the tribes. But the Levites were especially responsible because they were the direct perimeter that surrounded the tabernacle and were responsible for assembling it and taking it down. So it's important for them to do everything just as Jehovah had instructed. Verse 38, those who were to camp in front of the tabernacle on the east, in front of the tent of meeting toward, tent of meeting toward the sunrise were Moses and Aaron and his sons who were in charge of the holy place. They carried out their responsibility on behalf of the people of Israel and anyone else who involved himself was to be put to death. The total number of Levites whom Moses and Aaron counted by their clans, all the males a month old and over, was 22,000. So now in these two clans that they brought together, 22,000 are the number of Levites who are in line that will be aligned on the east, which is the entrance, which is the most important place, and facilitating the guarding and everything else of the tabernacle. So no one could come and go as they please. They came and go as Jehovah ordered. And so that was the purpose of them being on the east side toward the entrance. Verse 40, Jehovah said to Moses, register all the firstborn males of the people of Israel a month old and over and determine how many there are. Then you are to take the Levites for me, Jehovah, in place of all the firstborn among the people of Israel and the cattle of the Levites in place of the firstborn of the cattle belonging to the people of Israel. Moses counted as Jehovah had ordered him, all the firstborn among the people of Israel. The total number of firstborn males registered a month old and over of those who were counted was 22,273. There's a long explanation for how those, where those 273 came from. We're not gonna go into that, that would take too long. Jehovah said, verse 40, 44, Jehovah said to Moses, Take the Levites in place of all the firstborn among the people of Israel and the cattle of the Levites in place of their cattle. Jehovah's repeating this, but is that important? Because death can be the result of not following these instructions exactly as they were given. Since there were 273 more firstborn males from Israel than male Levites in order to redeem them, you ought to take five shekels for each of these. Use the sanctuary shekel and give the redemption money for these extra people to Aaron and his sons. So this is what the priest would use to live off of, although it was primarily to help others because they would get their food and everything from their clan as well as from the uh, sacrifices that were made at the tabernacle. But you see, once again, the connection between what took place and freeing the children of Israel and how that is to be looked at and why Passover is such an important festival for the Jewish people, because all of this is related to that. And it still exists, even though there's no temple, it's been destroyed 
there's no temple, but these rules and regulations for the firstborn and all of that still take place. All right, we go on. Moses took the redemption money from those who were over and above those redeemed by the Levites. The amount of money he took from the firstborn of the people of Israel was 1,365 shekels using the sanctuary shekel or the scale. Moses gave the money to Aaron and his sons in keeping with what Jehovah had said as Jehovah had ordered Moses. With that, we're going to go to chapter uh, four and see if we can get through this. But we kind of explained as we were going where that all, what that all amounts to. And that was spoken of in Leviticus. And now you're getting more information and more instruction is given to the priests because they're responsible for making sure that people understand these things from now on. From that point on, even through today, even though it's rabbis who taken the responsibility of the priesthood in terms of the Jewish people, still these, these acts, even though they can't sacrifice animals and all of those things, these acts still take place because there were things that were supposed to be done forever. So let's go on to chapter four. Jehovah said to Moses and Aaron, Take a census of the descendants of Kahat, who were among the descendants of Le the Levites by clans and family. All those from 30 to 35 years old, these will enter the core of doing the work in the tent of meeting. There has to be things carried. We're going to get into that. Here is how the descendants of Kahat, and these were what? From 30 to 50 years old, older, stronger, bigger, and what? More wise to make sure they do it the way your <laughs> wants. Here's how the descendants of Kahat are to serve in the tent of meeting and deal with the especially holy things. When their times come to break camp, Aaron is to go in with his sons. Aaron and his two sons. Take down the curtain, which serves as a screen, and cover the ark of the testimony with it. So you're going to take down the, the curtain that separates the holy of holies from the holy place, you're going to take that curtain and cover the ark with it. Verse 6, on, on that they are to place a covering of fine leather and on top of that spread of an all blue cloth. So there's two things that take place on top of that curtain that are coverings for the ark of the covenant. Then they are to insert the carrying poles. On the table of showbread, they are to spread a blue cloth and place on it the dishes, incense pans, offering bowls, and pitchers. <clears throat> the perpetual bread is to remain on the table. They are to spread on these things a scarlet cloth, cover them with a covering of fine leather, and insert the pole. They're going to be carrying the table of the showbread on their shoulders. They are to take a blue cloth and cover the menorah for the light, its lamps, its tongs, its trays, and the jars used to add oil to it. They are to wrap it in all its accessories in fine leather and place them on a carrying frame. On the gold altar, they are to spread a blue cloth, cover it with a covering of fine leather and insert its carrying poles. They are to take all the utensils they use when serving in the sanctuary and put them in a blue cloth, cover them with fine leather and place them on a carrying frame. After removing the green the greasy ashes from the altar, they are to spread a purple cloth over it and place on it all the utensils required for their altar services, the fire pans, meat hooks, shovels, basins, and other utensils for the altar. They are to spread it over it, the fine leather covering, and insert its carrying pole. So that's the altar that the sacrifices are burned on. They're carrying poles for it, and they cover it. Aaron and his sons have to cover it. No one else can cover it. They are not to even come and deal with it until they have been covered by Aaron and his two sons. At that point, the, the stronger Levites from 30 to 50 can then grab the poles and carry that during the procession. Verse 15, when Aaron and his sons have finished covering the holy furnishings and all the holy utensils, when the camp is about to move forward. Then the descendants of camp of Kahat are to come and carry them, but they are not to touch the holy things so that they won't die. These things are the responsibility of the descendants of Kahat 
in the in the tent of meeting. So once again, the penalty for these things transgressing these rules, these instructions is death. So that's why they Moses is repeating it, and he didn't just repeat it twice, but there was probably conversation about it, but that's not written in the scriptures. Let's go on. Verse uh, 16, Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, is to be responsible for the oil for the light, the fragrant incense, the continuing grain offering, and the anointing oil. He is to be in charge of the entire tabernacle and everything in it, including the sanctuary and its furnishing. Jehovah said to Moses and Aaron, do not cut off the clan of Kahath from among the Levites. Rather, do this for them so that they will live and not die. When they approach the especially holy things, Aaron and his sons are to go in and you are to assign each one his task. But the descendants of Kahath are not to go in and look at the holy things as they are being covered. If they do, they will die. So Aaron and his sons, are responsible for covering everything. That responsibility cannot be shifted to anyone else. That is your responsibility, your descendants in the priesthood of the Levites will, be, will assume this responsibility from you. But you are responsible. So if they, are, if they don't know it, don't let them go in there and grab it. You got enough to where you can appoint those that understand what they're supposed to do. But you're responsible because their life is in your hand. Because if they pick these up, just like what transpired when David was taking the Ark of the Covenant, putting it on a cart and taking it back to Jerusalem, what happened? The man put his hand out to study it and he was killed because only the Levites were given the responsibility of carrying the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders. No one else could carry it. Only those appointed by Aaron and his son were, were, could go in there and carry it. And they better understand, when somebody tells you if you don't do it, you're going to die, well, there might be those who will try it, but they would get the penalty of death because it was that important. And a whole lot of people don't have to die before you start paying attention. Not the way it is now. A whole lot of people die every day and nobody's paying attention. But these were specific instructions given to these priests on the direction of Jehovah that they were supposed to teach the entire world. The difference between the holiness of Jehovah and the sin nature of man and how important it was to distinguish that they were in a, you're in a journey of holiness. Jehovah decides what's holy and what is not. Jehovah decides who can come close to the holy things and who cannot. Jehovah decides all of these things. And so since he decides, you better follow his instruction because that's all woven into what he is attempting to teach people and teach man. And he held his first two sons accountable. And when they burned the strange, Aaron's sons burned the strange incense, they were burned immediately. And Aaron was told, don't even mourn for him because they should have known better. They had been instructed for seven days about what they were supposed to do. And you don't change what Jehovah has given as his instruction. You don't go changing that on your own. <laughs> you don't do that. As man has done, especially in this particular dispensation we're in, when we don't even know anything about all, all of these instructions that Jehovah gave to the priests. People were just going to the tabernacle, but the job of the priest, that's why they took them from a month old and older, was to learn these things. Their primary purpose was to stay in the study of the instructions of the Torah and then transfer that information to the people so that the people would understand what it is Jehovah had required them to do. And so this is very important. So on this journey that was going towards the land of Canaan, the people had to be focused on the fact that they were carrying the holy item. They were to march in columns as Jehovah had designated. When the camp was reset up, it, it was established around the tabernacle. 
and the direct perimeter around the tabernacle in the courtyard were the Levites. They were responsible for keeping the people at a distance from the holy place. These were their instructions and this was to separate based on what Jehovah has instructed, what is holy and what is not. When we're called to be a royal priesthood, you go back and you understand some of these things and you'll understand that you are, you're separate from things, the other people that are in existence. Your purpose is to study the word, is to present the word and to be a living epistle of the word so that others can understand and recognize well, who Jehovah is and what is the relationship between man and Jehovah, our creator, and how we are supposed to behave towards one another. All of this, these important areas that we've just gone through in the separating and the order is how Jehovah has ordered things. And so once Jehovah orders things in a particular way, when you follow the directions, blessings will flow. When you choose to do things in your own way, then you are bringing about a curse upon yourself for your disobedience. It is much more beneficial to each one of us to learn with every intent on being obedient and to the instruction that Jehovah has for us. Because we are, as Paul said, living epistles, read of men, and our actions and our thoughts and our deeds are supposed to be different from all others in the world. We're supposed to march, as they say, to a different drummer. And our drummer is Jehovah through the Holy Spirit and what Yeshua, who died for us, who paid the ransom price for us, has done so that we can understand the instructions and obey them. So thank you so much for joining me on today. We'll get together again on Shabbat Shalom. I don't believe we have anything <laughs> scheduled. So it'll be at the regular Eastern time of 8 p.m. that we will go through the Haftarah. Uh, we are now in the book of Numbers. In Hebrew, it is Bamitba, which means in the wilderness. And so whenever we think about it, we want to think about the different channels and ch challenges that come into our life as an experience that Jehovah wants us to take and utilize to glorify his name. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for the Ruach HaKodesh who comes to guide us into all truth. Thank you for each and every one that has joined us on this on today for this blessed opportunity to study your word line upon line and precept upon precept. We thank you and we praise you in the name of your son, Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen and amen. All right. Shalom. I'll see you on Shabbat Friday evening for the Haftarah of Lesson 34. Shalom.